All right, everyone, it's about two minutes before the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, once again, uh, my name is Christine Brown. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at the Reno Sparks Chamber. Uh, it's great to have you. It's great to see you today. Um, I'm sure there are still some other folks hopping on the call. We had quite a few registrations for today, but um, as is the nature of the current uh, landscape, we, we typically have a lot more registrants than actually come to the course. Um, but that's fine because we actually post all of our sessions uh, after the the fact on our YouTube page to watch on demand. So uh, members and also the general public can access the information at any time. We don't want there to be any barriers to accessing the content. So we're happy to do that for everyone. Um, really quickly, uh, I want to introduce uh, the man of the hour, Dr. Ted Cross. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Dr. Cross is the Associate Dean of the Graduate Programs in the College of Business at Western Governors University. And we're so lucky uh, to have Western Governors University and their involvement in our Chamber EDU Business 101 series. Um, but before we get into uh, Dr. Cross's session on the, uh, finding the meaning, finding meaning in, in work and, uh, and in life, uh, both, um, I'll just go ahead and share a little bit about what Chamber EDU is. So Chamber EDU was created in the midst of the pandemic uh, to serve as the educational arm for the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. We're pleased to bring all sorts of sessions to our members and to uh, other folks as well, whether it's connecting people to experts in the community in regard to what's happening uh, and what is current with the COVID-19 uh, crisis response or if it's connecting to a lawmaker or a decision maker or influential person in the community. And this Business 101 series, the spirit behind it is really to connect uh, folks to good business practices and principles of good business citizenship and leadership that are gonna help them navigate and move forward uh, beyond COVID-19 and, and getting back to the things that we know are always going to be true, uh, whether we're in a space where we're changing or innovating, or whether uh, we're in a space where uh, we're enjoying prosperity. So um, with that, I also want to thank our uh, chamber partners. Uh, we've got quite a few folks uh, who underwrite these programs for our members. Um, I want to specifically thank Prominence Health Plan, St. Mary's Health Network, the Atlantis, and Nevada Mining Association for uh, taking interest in providing this content um, to everyone on the call and beyond. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. And so we are incredibly grateful um, for their belief in our work and for their support of it. Uh, we've got a couple uh, a couple more sessions in the series coming up through the end of the month, and I encourage you to visit the Reno Sparks Chamber website to access that registration information. Consider yourselves invited. I would love to see um, some familiar names and faces on the call once again. Um, and just another housekeeping item for the call. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take take questions after the session is complete. Uh, you can either enter questions into the chat box um, at any point throughout the call and, and we will address those at the end. Or uh, you can always enable your audio and video at the end of the call when Q&A comes and we will go ahead and address your questions uh, as you would like to present them. So uh, just do whatever is in accordance with your comfort level. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, Dr. Cross, I would love to turn it over to you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Glad to tell you a little bit about my, myself. So I am the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs here at Western Governors University. Um, excited to be talking with you today. I often do webinar series on um, the science of personal leadership. So how can we lead ourselves before we lead others? And one of the topics that I often start with is um, the idea of finding personal purpose in, in your own life and how that can translate into an organizational setting, particularly when um, we're in some turmoil during the pandemic, this, this might be useful. Similarly, I'd like to talk a little bit today about um, work-life balance and how we can conceptualize that or not conceptualize that uh, given our current circumstances and just the nature of the modern work world. My presentation will probably be 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll have time for, um, for questions after. Let me go ahead and, and see if I can share my screen properly here. Let me, let me first get into my full screen. Okay. And Sharon, tell me when you can see that. Give me the thumbs up. Okay, good. 
<laughs> and then I'll just go from the start. I told you a little bit about myself, but the title today is The Science of Personal Leadership, Escape the Myth of Work-Life Balance. And we're also gonna talk about finding personal purpose, as I mentioned. And um, I often get questions about the myth of work-life balance, which I'll address in a minute. But really, I wanna start off talking about zookeepers. And this is kind of a, a strange place to start, but um, there was a study a number of years ago by a couple actually it was a business researcher and someone in sort of governmental affairs, Thompson and Bunderson, and they were, had a strange idea. They noticed that when they're looking at some of the employment data, that there were lots and lots of applicants for the zookeeper positions that were open. So there's a ton of applicants, but they noticed that there wasn't very many positions. So huge amount of people who want to be zookeepers, not very many uh, jobs available actually for zookeepers. And so they're wondering about this because when they thought about it and you looked at sort of like the job rec and the conditions and sort of what they knew from going to the zoo that zookeepers often work in some not so nice uh, environments, uh, you know, cleaning up after animals, there's uh, hot, cold outside, right? All the time. There's all kinds of challenges in the working conditions. And they also noticed that on average, zookeepers didn't make a lot of money. So they're wondering, okay, so how come there's so many people who want to be zookeepers, but it doesn't pay much, there's not very many jobs, and the working conditions aren't great. And so they decided to, to do a, a qualitative study and interview a bunch of zookeepers to see what, what could they find out. And really what they found out is that um, most people, non-zookeepers in this instance, view their sort of world of work in several, through several lenses, either as, hey, I have a job and that earns me a paycheck. Uh, I have a career, I'm proud of it, I'm climbing the ladder, right, maybe the corporate ladder, I'm, I'm trying to accomplish something, setting goals. I have a calling, I feel like, man, I'm called to something bigger than myself or even a vocation, um, I believe that uh, some higher power has made me a match for the work that I'm involved in. And what these researchers found is that zookeepers definitely saw their work as a calling or a vocation. So this notion that they were called to their work, they were made for the work they were doing, they were working on something that was bigger than themselves, and that seems fairly obvious if we step back and think about it, but the interesting thing that the researchers are pointing out is that because these people were um, feeling called to their work and having a really strong sense of purpose in their work, they were willing to put up with low pay, harsh work conditions, and maybe even societal respect that's a little bit less than other types of careers that you might choose, right? And so that was interesting from a motivation standpoint. And I think it's interesting for us all to consider. I mean, Thompson and Butter, Bunderson say, look, our calling or our vocation is that place in the world of productive work that we feel like we've been created, designed, or destined to fulfill by the virtue of God-given talents or a higher power, however you want to um, sort of uh, summarize that. And that our talents match opportunities that have been uh, sort of presented to us, right? So this, this feeling of, being called in to this zookeeper, or we know we have people we know that have a very, what I would say, easy career calling fit type jobs. Like maybe someone you know is a firefighter or someone who's working on the front lines during the pandemic or is in the healthcare um, industry, right? It seems fairly easy for them to sort of, um, articulate and to understand for themselves that they have a higher purpose in their job, right? They're helping people, um, they're saving buildings and lives, and there's all these different things, right? And, and similar to those zookeepers, they could sort of frame their work in the sense of, wow, I'm working for something bigger than myself, I'm helping animals, and also there's ecology and sustainability tied up into there, right? And so there's this very easy way to take the job role and map it to meaning and purpose and vocation and calling. But 
the question really is, is purpose and meaning and calling job centric? Are we going to be job centric or are we going to figure out how to be more purpose centric? And I like to tell a little antidote I heard a while ago. It's um, there is an American traveler. He went to Italy and this is the picture on the left hand side of your screen. And when he was in Italy, he began walking around the streets and he saw uh, a couple local people and like a typical American, he said, how are you? Um, they actually struck up a conversation with him, you know, because Americans really don't mean, uh, how are you? We just mean hi, right, or hello. But anyway, so he starts talking with these people. And uh, the next thing you know, they're asking him questions about himself. And the questions are, where are you from? What's your, who's your family? What brings you to Italy? And then he's talking with them about their families and their um, history in the, in the town, et cetera. Fast forward a couple months later, this same man is back in the United States and this is the right hand side of your screen. He's at a typical dinner party in the United States, okay? And he's meeting some new people at this dinner party. And uh, one of the first questions that comes up, you guessed it, what do you do, right? What do you do? And that question, of course, is just uh, a heuristic or a shortcut for us in society, in America at least, to um, sort of size people up and decide if we're going to pay attention to them, if their status is high enough in the hierarchy for us to uh, actually make sure we want to make friends with them, if they can do something for us, how much respect they should receive, how much power we think they have. That's very different than in other places in the world, uh, and many of you may have experienced this. Um, other places, of course, are asking about who are you? Where are you from? Tell me about your family and your roots and your genealogy and sort of your connection to place, right? Not what do you do? So in the US, we really focus on uh, human doings rather than human beings. And um, what I'm going to argue here is that we really need to make sure that the purpose that we're framing for ourselves in whatever work we're doing, whatever calling we're finding for ourselves is not job centric, but it's purpose centric. So in other words, our calling or purpose in life is not a job. So if, if you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know Dr. Cross what my calling in life is. Um, I'm a teacher and I'll say wrong because that's a job title. So anytime that you can name a job title as, as your quote unquote purpose, mission statement, whatever you want to call it, it's probably not your purpose or mission statement. Now, let me back up a bit and say, the reason why I believe it's important for us each to have some sort of uh, calling or, or um, sense of purpose in our work is because yes, the studies show that employees are more productive if they feel more um, uh, purposeful and find more meaning in their work. They retain better. We know those studies uh, in the leader leadership literature that I study, but also um, there's better health outcomes and I'll show you that in a bit later, as well as just the, just the sheer notion that we spend something like a half of our lifetime time working or more, right? And so if we can't find purpose in it, it's really hard um, to sort of live a full life, if you will, and sort of find that way to um, leverage your strengths in a way that's gonna make a difference just in your community, just in yourself, just in your family. We're not saying change the world here, but change yourself, right? And change the way that you look at your work. Now, I have a slide here, uh, it says life, death in Japan. Um, let me explain. The life and death part is that there's a number of studies that show there's two times uh, in life, at least in the Western world, when we're most likely to die. And that's right after you're born because of infant mortality and right after you retire. And they're not really sure what the reasons are behind after retiring. And by the way, 
uh, more men die after they retire than women. And they think that might have to do with men not being very good sometimes at social connections outside of the workplace. Um, so there's not a network to fall back on. But they, the researchers are starting to believe that there is something to do with purpose and sort of how much of our identity in the US is tied up into what we do at work. Like we said, um, what do you do? I am a, right? So it's not just that I work at, I work with, it's I am. It's a, a literal definition of our own identity. And as we do that, um, that can be fulfilling until it's not, right? Until you retire or until the job market changes until life circumstances change and things have to change. And so there's a real danger in tying up all of our identity into just a work title, a job or a career. Um, even if we're sort of feeling very motivated and sort of uh, called to that type of work, the question is, what if you had to change jobs, right? What if you retired, what are you gonna do? And it's, it's sort of interesting, you know, my wife and I talk about this a lot, like we have this strange mentality in the US about saving it all for the end, right? So it's like, um, hey, uh, I'll, I'll go tour Europe once I retire, right? Or I'm going to um, learn to paint once I have some time after I retire or after I downshift my career, or whatever, right? There's a lot of those kinds of talks that go around and that makes a lot of sense except for it doesn't because um, <laughs> I worked uh, with my dad for a long time in retirement planning. This is one of the reasons this comes up in my, in my talks a lot. And he has 30 plus years working with people planning for retirement. And he said, Ted, I've never met anyone who retired too early. Now, the, the, the reason he's saying that is because they were saving up their money and lives to do stuff that they wanted to do. And that sometimes people didn't make it just to be blunt um, to that end goal. And what I'm arguing is uh, maybe we should be living now. Like <laughs> maybe we should be trying, I'm not saying go spend all of your money or your retirement accounts, but what I'm saying is that mentality of uh, tying our entire identity to a job that maybe not that you need to change jobs, but that we're not framing in the right way. So it's not just about, there's a great book called Rework, R-E-W-R-K. It's, it's about reframing your current job to gain more purpose and perspective. And that's what we're going to talk about here in a second. But how do we start extracting meaning and some of the fun and some of the things we want to do sooner rather than later? Yes, there is advantages to delayed gratification and sort of, you know, Dr. Michelle's marshmallow test video that we've all seen. But at the same time, there's also this idea of, hey, are you delaying meaning? Are you delaying experiences? Are you delaying what you would like to do just for an artificial, I don't know what, right? So in Japan, they have this idea of ikigai. And this is the idea that they have a, um, a life force or a life purpose. So some some people in Japan, they their ikigai is to help mentor youth. And so they give one example in, in the book Blue Zones of a um, karate master who was 90 plus years old still te teaching karate because his purpose was to help mentor youth and change their lives and, and, and continue to teach the tradition that was so old, right? And so that's kind of like what question we are to now is like, okay, if, if my calling and my purpose isn't encapsulated in a job, which I say is dangerous because then your whole identity is job dependent, how do we define our calling? How do we define our, how do we find that? And I'll tell you a, a bit about sort of how I got to the process and what, I, and, and stay with me. We're going to come back to how do you get to uh, figuring out your own life purpose and um, mission statement, if you will. But first, we need to also talk a little bit about work-life balance because they're uh, 
integrally cl cl uh, connected to each other. And if we don't sort of parse them apart, we're not gonna be able to understand. So when I was in school, I got to uh, learn from Dr. Stuart Friedman at the Wharton School. He's in charge of the Wharton Work Life Integration Project. And he wrote a book called Total Leadership. And he caught us off guard one day when he came into class and he said, uh, all right, let's talk a little bit about work-life balance. Like, all right. And so we started writing our notes, of course. And he said, imagine that your life is divided into roughly four domains or four categories. You have your work domain, you have your self domain, you got your family domain, whatever that means to you. And you have your community domain that can just be friends or that could be your church group or whatever is community. So he said, just let's agree that we have about four life domains, four areas. And he says, um, and, and you, you might try this mentally. Let's do a little exercise mentally for yourselves. He said, um, take those domains, work, self, family, community, and rank them in order of important, importance, one through four. So if I believe family is most important, that goes one then maybe I think community is two, work is three, self is four, right? So do that mentally for yourself. Rank one through four, one being most important and four being least important. Uh, work, self, family, and community. Let's give you one second to think about that. And I'm gonna look to Christine once she's done, then I'll say, okay. We're, we're kind of, okay. So you have your things ranked one through four, even if it's just in your mind. All right, got your priorities straight. Now I want you to do the same thing, rank order the same categories, but this time where you spend the most time and, and put it side by side. Now, I'm not going to call Sharon out or, or Christine, but what mostly happens and what happened to me when I did this exercise way back when is that there was a mismatch between what my stated priority list was and where I spent my time. Now, some of that is just life, right? Like, yeah, my family is most important, but I spend most time at work, right? And, or, yeah, I really think that I should uh, value self care, but I don't spend any time in self-care, right? And so what Friedman's sort of point was is that if we are operating in a paradigm of balance, then we're gonna be very disappointed because priorities and time spent as measures are very hard to equal out. And so what he pointed out is that balance is really a zero sum game. If I for instance, on this slide, need 10 hours a day to work, which is fairly typical and maybe more during the pandemic because we're stuck in front of Zoom, right? Um, if I need 10 hours in my work domain a day, then I have to balance that with 10 hours of self time. If I'm, if I'm really gonna balance, right? And then I gotta have 10 hours of family time and 10 hours of community time. So just 40 hours a day and I can have a balanced life. So what Friedman and what I'm arguing is that balance is not a very good model, even though we, we probably don't think about balance that, oh, everything has to be equal. There is a subtext and a presupposition that you're going to try to give somewhat equal-ish energy or time or resources to different areas of your life. And the answer is that's not even possible. <laughs> it's not possible. And what I think is happening is that people are getting discouraged as they're working on work-life balance because it's not possible to achieve. I mean, think about this. Um, unbalanced results come from unbalanced efforts. So I don't know anybody who done really great things that was balanced in the way <laughs> that they did things. You know, think about the great musicians, uh, sports players, um, uh, 
great executives or teachers or authors, right? They put an unbalanced amount of time and effort into a certain area to get those results. And there was trade-offs and sacrifices and that was okay. So that's another reason to, I think, avoid sort of this idea of balance is that it breeds mediocrity. So I would like to argue that we should have an integration model rather than a balance model. So rather than trying to make sure that all those life domains are exactly equal in time and energy, how can we say they're integrated and they work together, even if there's not equal time and energy in each? And my sort of thesis here is that personal purpose is the glue that ties all those and drives all those together. So for instance, if I figure out that my personal purpose is going back to mentoring students or mentoring the next generation, I can do that in my work domain. I can do that uh, in my home domain if I have kids or family members or nieces or nephews, I can do that in the community. And I can uh, work on mentoring uh, preparation in the self domain. But if I'm saying I'm a teacher, like I used to say, right? works in the work domain, uh, doesn't make my wife too happy when I'm doing lecture series at home. Community, I might be able to find a spot for that. Self, uh, yeah, I guess I can read books, but see, it doesn't really work real well. And the other thing is that um, if we have a personal purpose that is more broad, it sort of inoculates us from the, the sort of changing employment um, market that we might be in, right? So if I not tying my whole identity into uh, I'm a teacher, but rather I like to mentor young people, then that changes everything and opens a bunch of options up, right? And that's what my skill set really is in. Now, certainly there are certain jobs I understand that are very technical in nature and that um, will be harder to change into a different job role, but you can still zoom out and have purpose. There's also two other things I should mention here on this slide is that um, to integrate these different life domains, you can also uh, think of a spillover effect. So if I'm feeling more purposeful in my work domain, that will positively spill over and positively affect my relationships at home and my community self, right? Um, if it's not so good, <laughs> then you know, we've all been through stressful times at work and it bleeds over into all these domains. So again, that's another way to, to say we need to integrate, not balance, because balance also somewhat uh, disaggregates the and compartmentalizes the different parts of our lives rather than saying, yeah, like they're all kind of blurry, right? So let's figure out how we can find personal purpose across all the domains and use that as sort of the, the glue. So let me give you an example of a process that I often use. And um, we sent the, I sent the um, worksheet for you all to take a look at later. And you can fill out, this is an example of filling out the worksheet. But if you look across the top, and this is an example my wife Stephanie filled out a while ago. And if you look across the top, there's the self-domain family community and work. And then under that, she listed um, key stakeholders in each of those domains. Okay, so you see different key stakeholders. And then under the arrows, um, actions in each domain, in each vertical that she likes doing, loves doing, and things she hates doing. So we're using a dialectical approach here that, that is, what are the opposites of things I like to do and things I hate to do in each domain? And what can it tell me? And as she listed those out, she started to come up with some ideas of what her purpose might be by doing qualitative research on herself, right? So she started saying, okay, in the actions I love and the actions I hate, what are some similar things that I'm seeing? Oh, I like helping people. I like um, uh, any type of service. She does not like making people uh, feel sad or meetings or paperwork, right? So she was starting to identify some of these things. And at the end she said, okay, 
what themes do I have? Well, I like being with people, doing things for others, making people happy, helping, creating, and helping kept coming up over and over. And she came up with a bunch of ideas for her own purpose. And at the end of the day, she says, I like to make people smile. Like that's one of her purposes. Now, she can do that in her work domain, right? She can do that at home. She can do that in her community, even if her job role changes in the work domain. For me, my purpose is uh, to make people think, right? And so I love new ideas and thinking of things in contrarian ways, hence the I don't believe in work-life balance. Um, and so if we can think about things uh, through different lenses, that makes me really happy and engaged, right? And so I used to say I was a teacher and now I say my purpose is to make or help people think and think freely. And um, I can fulfill that in lots of ways. And that's actually freeing to me rather than boxing myself in. So you can go through this similar exercise for yourself, but what you're seeing is, and remember, purpose is not job specific or centric. And second, you're gonna zoom out and get very broad on that purpose idea. And last is that it's okay, it's going to change over time, right? It, you'll revise and you'll find one emphasis at one phase in your life and another emphasis at another phase in your life. And that's totally normal. So what I'd like to do right now is, is end with a quote from Viktor Frankl who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he says, everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life. Everyone must carry out a concrete assignment that demands fulfillment. Therein, he cannot be replaced or can his life be repeated. Thus, everyone's task is unique as his specific opportunity to implement it. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Well, before you do that, Ted, um, thank you so much, Dr. Cross, for doing this presentation. And I'm laughing because you, you just summed it up perfectly. Um, just you doing this presentation indicates your willingness to provoke people to think and to think out of the box a little bit, because a lot of our, as we know, a lot of our colleagues and peers on the academic side um, don't necessarily want to get out in front of uh, a lot of the folks that I connect with. So I do appreciate that. And I'm glad you're living your values. Sure. Yes, sure, thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cross, for that presentation. I know there are already folks in the chat saying, can we get that presentation? Can we see the slides? Can we get that worksheet? Um, thank you again for providing not just the slides in advance um, so that they can be sent out to the attendees on the call, but also that worksheet. So links to uh, several things have been dropped in chat. So a link to the worksheet. Um, a link to um, other sessions in this Science of Personal Leadership series that Dr. Cross has given and are available online. And then also a link to more Chamber EDU sessions as well. So you can uh, explore those and register. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and break the ice with a question. And, um, and again, just remind everyone, if you have a question, feel free to enable your video, unmute, or pop something in the chat if that is your style. So whatever is most comfortable for you. So. I think that uh, we have this, and and to your point, this you know a, a fallacy, this notion that work and life are existing in opposition to each other. Um, what are some ways that we can begin to deconstruct that notion and and to not see work as the enemy of life, and not to see life as the enemy of success at work? Man, that's a really great question. That's a it's a tough one. I think that one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that um, during the pandemic, many of us have had to start working from home if we could. And suddenly <laughs> we had integration, whether we wanted it or not, right? It's like sure. everything's together. Um, but when I started thinking about like the history of work, most of, for most of human existence, we all worked from home, right? Like, so you, you you, you came down the stairs maybe in the 1700s to your shop or you uh, were a farmer and you lived on your farm, right? And so there was sort of, that wasn't a new notion. It wasn't until like the industrial revolution that we sort of had people going to work, if you will, quote unquote, going to work. And so I think that in some ways uh, we're experiencing um, the paradigm switching back from what the industrial revolution did to us 
but it's jarring because we're not used to this and our lives are not in our homes. Sometimes are not set up to do it. Right. I mean, there isn't this shop underneath my apartment that I could go down to right. get away from everything, you know? Um, and so I think that one is stepping back and saying, okay, what does it mean to go to work and how has it been historically? And have we been living in an anomalous time that is somewhat unnatural? I don't know. That's the question. Right. And so, and then from there, it's like, how do I, how do we make what is work? And so you can do a gaps analysis on your situation, like go to what is, uh, analyze what should be, right? You know what I mean? And then figure out what is the space in between what is and what should be and how that can be a little more, what tweaks can we make to, to make things a little easier? I also think that like, we don't want to be, uh, Americans are known as workaholics, right? So, I mean, what I'm not preaching here is, do you guys remember there was like a, I think it was like a Ford commercial. I got a ton of flack because it basically was saying, um, work and ignore your family and you can have this really nice car, right? And um, there was a lot of discussion about that. The question is like, how can you express your purpose in those different domains outside of work that would keep you engaged in family and community? And so I think what we're struggling with the most right now is that we had really, really sort of um, strong boundaries pre-pandemic and now we have none and so there might be some real I think benefit in creating some hard stops and boundaries between sort of work time if you will I have a friend who puts on his suit every morning gets on zoom and then his kids know when he goes and changes his clothes back into play clothes right that it's uh, he's, he's done working for the day, even though he's in the same house. And so there are some artificial things we can do like that to create boundaries that can really help. Um, but I think that it is a challenging time to be thinking about what is integration versus pure chaos and what kind of, what kind of boundaries do we want to create even in sort of this, you know, the home, the house, the apartment is the gym is the workplace is the everything school. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and who your coworkers are that kids suddenly become coworkers and how practical can that really be? And, and, and how sustainable can that really be? Uh, and, and on the flip side, uh, you know, uh, parents becoming their kids teachers as well. I mean, there are a lot of intersections, yeah. there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways to integrate, that may or may not be sustainable, but there, but there are ways to honor honor those concepts um, and and maintain the spirit of those concepts while still having some appropriate boundaries. For sure. All right. Um, what other questions? I want to open it up to the floor uh, now that the ice is broken. I see someone with their hands up and enthusiastic. Go I, ahead. I, I tried to. I have this virtual background <laughs> that doesn't always seem to work right. Uh, Dr. Cross, thanks for uh, sharing your ideas. I, I love the, and I've seen it before in different forums about, you know, rank and order your priorities. And I especially like the blended part because as I started to think, wow, I, family is really important, but it doesn't necessarily rise to the top in, in the course of my week just because of, you know, the craziness of today. And so, yeah. Um, and I tried to look at the worksheet that you had. Um, what other kind of materials could I share for like a, a team building? Uh, because we have, you know, our, the organization I'm with, we have a lot of goals and uh, we need to reach those goals in, in order to be, you know, quote unquote, successful. Yeah. Uh, but we are a family organization. So it's, um, so there is a lot of uh, family intermingled into what we do. And uh, we are, we actually had a team building uh, activity last night at the key and code here locally. We did a, uh, escape room. <laughs> so yeah. it, uh, it, it worked out being fun because we had our, our family members and stuff with us. So I, I'm just trying to, you know, the, the, the hours of the day sometimes are not enough. Uh, the list is long. Uh, and yet trying to keep those uh, ideals of uh, some sort of integration of holistic balance, I suppose, because you can't, you can't really just say, I'm going to focus all my time here. And, yeah. and whereas 
I look at like PTO or, you know, or vacation time, that's where I'm fully integrated or fully focused on some of those key areas. And any other uh, points of wisdom or places to go for resources? I think that uh, you, you hit on a really interesting um, tactic, which is what Friedman calls simultaneity, which is like you had the escape room um, team building thing center of family business, family was there. So you integrated work, family, and community all in one, right? One shot. And uh, that is often a, a great technique to use. Is like, how, how can we bring the family along and involve and work things that I have to go to anyways that might be interesting for, uh, for the family? And then other resources, of course, is there's a guy named Dan McAdams out of Northwestern. And he um, writes a lot about autobiography and life story and he has it's a more in-depth worksheet about recording sort of your own personal narrative and what themes come out of that he calls them turning points so what turning points and there's a turning points activity you can google by Dan McAdams as well and it shows like okay if I plotted out my life on a timeline um, where are the big moments where my life could have went one way or another and it turned one way rather than the other way. And how does that sort of inform my own identity? And that can help a whole team building exercise on sharing those out. Like I had done one of those one time where we actually just wrote out our, our sort of life stories and turning points in like one page. And then like we paired up with different people and told them about our stories. And it was very sort of enlightening to hear like that personal history and what, and especially in a family business, like what does your sister think is their turning points versus what you might've thought, you know, or whatever, like, and that can really start to reveal, okay, wow. What does that tell us about what, how people frame meaning and meaningful work in their lives and in the workplace. And so I think that can be a very interesting activity. Great, thanks Thanks for sharing today. All thanks right. for coming. Thank you, Paul, for that question. Um, are there any other questions out there? We probably have time for one or two more if there's anyone else out there. Well, I've got another one. I always have a ton of questions. <laughs> that, that, is my, that is probably my personal style. Uh, my personal value, having a lot of questions. Um, so I, I think uh, I, I know that one's job or occupation is most certainly one piece of the puzzle. My, my question is, when, when you start to do this work, when you start to ascertain what, what your personal values are, you know, perhaps what, what your personal mission is or what your personal mission statement is that informs and integrates all the parts of your life, what do you do when you discover that perhaps your job is is not is not really serving that purpose? What what do you what do you do next? Do you do you recommend really fighting hard to assert your personal purpose into the workspace, or when when do you say when do you say enough is enough and perhaps try and find a new job? Or is that even yeah. a question that should yeah. be asked? <laughs> no, I think that's the right question. And uh, sometimes it is. It, sometimes our values are not aligned with where, where we're working. And that's depending on our personal circumstances and what's available out in the job market. It may be time to, to make a move. Um, the other way to, of course, negotiate this is to reframe your current work. There's a famous... Um, book called Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and he talks about sort of flow states of when you sort of get in the zone uh, either in sports or work and other things and he was interviewing uh, a woman who worked at a hospital and she was in in charge of sanitizing rooms and after patients had left and before the new patient came and this researcher said like, why are you so happy at your job or just cleaning rooms? And she said, I'm not just cleaning rooms, I'm helping patients stay healthy, right? And so she had reframed sort of her job and she saw it in a different way. So part of it is, yeah, what perspective do we have on what we're trying to do? Uh, can we infuse work, uh, meaning into our work to your point? And then yes, sometimes it is depending on the circumstances, 
who your boss is often, uh, those kinds of things, it might be time to make a change, but it certainly never hurts to try to infuse meaning into those, uh, into your current situation. All right, thank you very much for that response and, and just opening it up one more time for any final questions from the attendees on the call. All right, well then to close out, I, I want to maybe perhaps end with this. Um, in, in zooming out to American society, um, what do you see as the number one barrier to life integration? And what is the number one opportunity that we have with us, with our particular worldview as Americans, to make integration a reality in our lives? So I think that um, one of the biggest barriers was sort of the notion of the nine to five. And so the pandemic has helped us shift away from that in positive ways and negative ways, right? We talked about no boundaries, the, the flip side good uh, of that is even as we all return to offices, we might not have to be there as often. And that flexibility is going to allow for, um, I think a little more integration than we had previously. The other, the other thing is there's a, a results oriented focus in American business. And that is certainly very important. Like, but sometimes there's a hidden agenda in there of um, FaceTime, uh, making sure that uh, you're, in the right meetings or at the right events, which is just part of sort of, sort of networking and social capital building, which it, we're never going to get away from. But I think that people are starting to question um, the means to the results. So uh, uh, for, for instance, um, here at WGU, we found that um, our enrollment counselors are actually more productive when they work from home rather than coming into a, a large, you know, building setting, which was exactly opposite of what we, what we believed, right? And so we're having a chance to sort of question some of those things. And then um, we have to be very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater as we go, come back into whatever normal life looks like as we all can go get vaccines and, and those kinds of things is like, what worked well in the old paradigm and what didn't. And my guess is it's gonna be a hybrid, right? Like maybe you're in the office three days a week and you're not two days a week, or maybe we're, there's a little big movement right now in the literature I'm seeing about moving to a four day work week um, because every company in the study that I read that moved to that saw productivity gains. So I think it's like, especially from management and leadership standpoint, like what are the structures we're putting people in? And what are the results we're getting? And what if we change some things, do the results stay the same or are they getting better? I mean, I don't miss my cubicle, but I do miss the, the sort of being able to go to work part and the social aspects, right? So it's like, how do you integrate those things? How do you get the best of both worlds? Absolutely. I think, you know, talking about challenges and opportunities simultaneously, I think that's exactly the moment that we're in. We're in a moment in which we're, we, we faced great challenge, we innovated, uh, and now it's an opportunity to rethink and reinvent the way that we work and the way that, that we approach, to your point, integrating work with life, with a society with community with family, um, and so it's it's fantastic to to have uh, your thoughts, Dr. Cross, as a as a guiding light and as um, a way to point us toward the way forward. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you for your questions. Um, again, if you want to chew on this some more, you're more than welcome to to rewatch the presentation. Um, on our YouTube page, or of course at the link that is provided in chat, uh, a different presentation, but same, uh, same material. 
And also we'll go ahead and with your permission, uh, Dr. Cross, send out those slides to everyone, um, if that's great. okay. All right, awesome. Uh, well, I thank you uh, again for being with us and I hope that uh, we can invite you back uh, again one day and for the attendees on the call, please uh, attend uh, any uh, Chamber EDU session that you wish and, and consider yourselves invited. And we thank you for being part of this today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, everyone. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Thank Bye you, now. everybody. Take care.